Hi, boys and girls. Miss Block here. We are reading Loser by Jerry Spinelli, and we are on Chapter 21, Something Hard and Thorny. It takes her a long time to climb from the top step into the living room. You can get the door, she says. He closes the door. It is dark inside, not as dark as a cellar, but dark for a house. No lights are on. So, she says. He waits for the rest, but that's all there is. So, she repeats it quite a few times as she makes her way across the living room. She sets the four legs of the walker out ahead of her, then catches up with her own two feet. Six legs she has. It's the world's slowest gallop. And then she heads into the dining room. So, it takes her as long to cross the living room and dining rooms as it takes him to walk to school. So, what would you like? What would he like? Not much, really. Take away today in his life. It has been pretty good. Then it hits him. They're in the kitchen. She's talking about food. Snickerdoodle, he says. It's the first thing that comes to mind. She stops. He stops behind her. She cocks her head to one side. Snickerdoodle? I haven't had heard that word in ages. My mother used to make snickerdoodles. He tries to picture the old lady with her mother. He can't. My mother makes snickerdoodles, he tells her. No, she doesn't, she says. They don't make them anymore. Well, she does, he says. No, she says firmly. Yes, he says, equally firmly. He's feeling a little annoyed. She seems to be staring at a leg of the kitchen table. She shakes her head but says nothing. She turns forward in the walker. Well, she says, I don't have snickerdoodles. She continues on across the kitchen. You'll have to ask for something else. Something else? He can think of many things he would like to eat, but he tries to remember he's not in a restaurant and he's not at home. A sandwich, he offers. A sandwich, she repeats his words so carefully, he wonders if she knows what a sandwich is. He has never been this close to a very, very old person before. He wonders how much there is that such a person does not know. A sandwich, a sandwich, she repeats as she continues her frozen gallop across the kitchen. The back legs of the walker land first with a rubbery thud, then the front legs, then the catch-up shushing the roan slippers on the linoleum. Thud, thud, shush, shush, a sandwich. He plops into a chair. He is almost woozy from slowness. She stops at a metal cabinet. How about a peanut butter and jelly, she says. Do children still like peanut butter and jelly? He has long since outgrown peanut butter and jelly. What he really wants is a pepper and egg sandwich like his mother makes with spicy. Okay. Brown mustard, but he guesses this is out of the question. Sure, he says. She fusses in the cabinet, fusses in the refrigerator. She finds the peanut butter. Can't find the jelly, she says. Today we'll have pretend jelly. How would you like that? He's ready to agree to anything. Okay, he says. She is so slow, so deliberate in every movement that he sees things he has never seen before. He had not known there were so many steps to the spreading of peanut butter on a slice of bread. Is this how things appear to the waiting man? A world in slow motion? After what seems like hours, she heads for the table, pushing the walker with one hand, holding a plated sandwich in the other. When she lays the plate on the table and heads back for the second sandwich, she jumps up. I'll get it. She transfers herself from the walker to a chair and at long last they set to eating. I'm pretending my jelly is gooseberry, she says. She is the color of white mice, pink scalp showing through white hair, pink eyelids. Her eyes are watery, but she is not crying. We used to have gooseberries on our farm. What's yours? Grape, he says. Jelly or jam, she says. He is stumped. Jelly, I guess. Jam is easier to spread. Okay, jam. Are you sure? I always thought jelly had more taste. Jelly. Not that it makes any difference. He really does try to pretend, but only tastes is peanut butter and bread. He's glad they're in the kitchen. It's not as dark as the rest of the house. The sandwich halves are in the shape of triangles. He likes it that way. It seems special. Before he knows it, his sandwich is gone. The old lady has barely begun. She eats as slowly as she walks. She looks at him. She puts down her sandwich and with a grimace reaches for the walker. I'll make you another. No, he says. He put his hand on her wrist. Her skin feels like newspaper. I'll do it. He gets up and makes himself another. Don't forget the jelly, she calls over her shoulder. He spreads pretend jelly. He slices a sandwich patty corner into triangles. He tries to eat this one more slowly. They do not speak. He wonders about something to drink, but he's afraid to ask. Do you know the waiting man, he says. She tilts her head and sniffs, as if trying to catch the full scent of the question. Waiting man? The man at the window, down the street, 924 Willow. She puts down her sandwich, the better to think. She shakes her head. I don't know any waiting man. He's been waiting for a long time, he says. A long time. He hopes she asks him how long. 
She looks at him. Her eyes are gleaming, but he is sure she is not crying. How long? Suddenly, he realizes the number is not handy. His father had originally said 32 years. That was in second grade. He's in fifth now. Three years, 32 plus three. He stares at her. Like stones, he drops each sound into the uncrying eyes. Thirty-five years. She does not seem impressed. She picks up her sandwich and takes a bite and chews for a long time. Her eyes drift away toward the living room, the beyond. What is he waiting for, she says. His brother. Oh, she says this matter-of-factly, nodding as if that explains everything. There's a clatter at the front of the house. He realizes it's the mail slot opening, letters being pushed through. His father is delivering. She doesn't seem to hear it. What's his name, she says. Who? The brother. The question surprises him. He has never wondered about the brother's name or the waiting man's, for that matter. I don't know, he says. She stares into in on the second half of her sand. She starts in on the second half half of her sandwich. He has long since finished his. He feels her staring at him as she chews. He is uneasy. When he looks at her for more than a second at a time, he discovers her skin is almost transparent, like thin ice over a December puddle. He feels he is looking into her. A thought pops into his head. The moment she stops chewing, she is going to ask him his name. He does not want her to ask. He does not want her to call out, Oh, Donald! Or, Oh, Zinkoff! He wants to be, Oh, Mailman! He must say something quickly, create a diverting action. I can spell tibulation, he blurts out, and he spells it for her. He has been waiting for years at school for someone to ask him. T-I-N-T-I-N-N-A-B-U-L-A-T-I-O-N. Her mouth drops open. Her eyes bold. She is astonished. She is amazed. And I got an A once in geography. It was the only A in the whole class. This time she sees not as much amazed as pleased. She nods and smiles. She is not surprised. She knew he could do it. Congratulations, she says. The echo comes in his parents' words. One thousand congratulations to you. And suddenly he remembers the day in the hospital when Polly was born, making a deal with his mother for two stars whenever he really needed them. Could he ever need them more than today? Do you have stars, he says. She looks at him funny. Stars? Those little paper stars, silver, that you stick on? He's about to say, your shirt, paper and stuff? She nods. She gets up and goes to a drawer in the cupboard. Stars, stars, she mutters as she roots through the drawers. She hauls the walker off to the dining room. He regrets, he asks. Stars, stars. She returns beaming. She's holding up something, but it's not a star. It's a turkey sticker, the size of a postage stamp. The kind Miss Meeks puts on a paper of his once or twice. She hands it to him. How about a turkey? A turkey is perfect. He sticks it on his shirt. He can't tell her how happy that turkey makes him feel. So happy now his eyes are watery too. And his breath flutters in his chest. And something hard and thorny goes out of him. And he tells her everything. He tells her about field day and why he isn't at school. He tells her about his two favorite teachers of all time. Miss Meeks and the learning train. And Mr. Yalowitz who said, And the Z shall be first. He tells her about his giraffe hat and jabip and jaboop. She laughs out loud at that. And the giant cookie for Andrew Orwell and Hector Binns and his earwax candle. He tells her about field day again and what the fox said and what Gary Hobbins said. And he tells her about the goalie scored for the Titans and what happened when he closed the door behind him in the cellar with the furnace monster, which, heaven help him, he still half believes in. On and on he talks, scooping the fruit out of his life and dropping it into her lap. He gives her his lucky pink bubblegum stone. She rubs it against her dress and gives it back. Through his tears, she is blurry, ghost-like. Her white hair sits upon her head like a puff of cotton. The kid he has always known himself to be seems to be napping nearby. When he wakes up, he is on the sidewalk. The lady is calling, Bye, mailman! From the step, and the sun is bright beyond the row house roofs. School is over. Knapsack kids are racing home. The air feels cool and new. The air feels good upon his face. Mm.